Okay, well, let's, uh, let's get started. Thanks everyone for joining this morning. Um, my name is Ian Stavnes. I'm with the Global Institute for Food Security at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, and it's my pleasure to host this webinar um, today where we will uh, have um, a, a discussion of the Global Week competition from 2021 and presentations from the winning uh, teams on the AI crowd competition. So I just wanted to start with a few slides to provide an overview of the, the data set and the competition. Um, I wanted to highlight uh, Etienne David from Arvelis and Wei Go from the University of Tokyo, who've also uh, been instrumental in, in organizing the data set and as well as the competitions we've held the last couple of years, as well as our numerous sponsors that have provided prize money for the competition, as well as um, um, some support to help uh, annotate the data set. So um, as, as most of you uh, likely know, the global wheat data, uh, data set or the global wheat detection data set, um, wheat head detection data set is a large data set we've assembled with uh, as, a, as an international uh, collaboration. So this is really inspired by the fact that we found significant variation in crop and plant images. And we wanted to try to capture that variation to improve the robustness of deep learning models. So models from one field, uh, see if they're transferable and try to develop new techniques that make them more transferable to different countries and different fields. And as you can see in these example images, there's substantial variation across different regions in the world due to the different genotypes of wheat that are used, the planting densities, the, the time of day or the time of season that the uh, images are captured um, uh, from different groups. And last year in 2020, we had the inaugural competition and the first version of the data set, which included data from seven countries, um, almost 5,000 images and almost or uh, just over 200,000 wheat head instances uh, annotated on those images. And we had a very successful first competition. And uh, one thing we found was that we were able to improve the annotations based on feedback from the, from the competition. Uh, and another thing we found was that we, we wanted to expand the data set to include more regions around the world. Um, so if we just took a look at the map, this is the 2020 version where we had contributions from these institutions. And we're happy in 2021 to have additional data sets contributed um, in North America, Europe, and Africa from an, a number of uh, additional institutions. So thanks very much to Kansas State University, the Terraref group uh, from Maricopa, Arizona, CMET, uh, University of Liège in Belgium, the Norwegian University of Life Sciences, as well as the uh, Agricultural Research Corporation in Sudan, uh, in collaboration with the University of Kyoto, who provided uh, data sets, um, as well as new data sets from some of the original uh, uh, regions. So in 2021, we held the competition uh, on the AI Crowd platform. And with this new data set, we have an additional six countries represented about another 2,000 images and about another 80,000 uh, instances. So again, this is a really, you know, really excited about this large international effort. This new version of the data set has also been contributed to the WILDS data set, which, which brings together a number of data sets to look at specifically domain shift in deep learning models. So we were happy to be able to contribute to that meta data set as well. And we had a very successful competition on AI Crowd. So thanks very much to the AI Crowd team who really helped set, set things up well and, and execute a really excellent competition. And we had participation from over 400 participants. And I'm pleased to announce the, the three winning teams um, did very, very good job this year. And we, we, still, we still find a, a, um, a drop in performance from the training set to the test set. So we still think that this is a, a, an interesting generalization challenge. But we found the winning submissions this year um, better than last year in terms of having um, a more robust solutions for the test set. So congratulations to the winning teams. So now we'll go through the, the teams have uh, prepared pre-recorded videos, which I'll play. And then after each video, we'll have a chance for a Q&A from the audience for the teams. So please just uh, use the Q&A panel. There's a, there should be a button in Zoom. Um, and you should be able to type in questions and then those will show up and I'll ask the questions to the teams um, as we go. Great, so I'm gonna stop sharing here and I'll switch over to the, to the first video. Uh, which is uh, the, the SMART team 
represented today by uh, Chen Xing Liu. So let me start with the uh, video. Hello, everyone. I'm Chen Xing Liu. Today, I will present our run-up solution to the Global Wheat Challenge 2021. Here is the outline, including team introduction, our solution, and summary. Let's first introduce ourselves. Our team name is SMART. We have two team members. We are from Huazhong University of Science and Technology, China. Our background and interest are computer vision and machine learning. Now let's talk about our solution. In the following, I will first analyze the data sets and review our observation. Second, I will introduce the details of data preprocessing. Finally, I will present how we model the wheat head detection. After inspecting the datasets, we summarized several challenges of wheat head detection. First, the illumination varies significantly from images to images. Here we show some examples of low illumination and high illumination. The former makes it difficult to distinguish wheat head objects, while the latter may lead to false positives in bright areas. Second, the appearance of wheat head varies at different growth stages. For example, the color of the spike is green at the post-flowering stage, but turns yellow at the ripening stage. Third, low quality images are also harmful to wheat head detection. For example, wind can result in blurred images, which further increase the difficulty of detecting wheat head objects. Fourth, we notice that the dataset contains annotation errors. As indicated by the yellow circles, the ground truth box in the left image is inaccurate. It covers a significant part of the background. And the ground truth boxes in the right images are totally wrong. This slide is a summary of our analysis. Note that the challenges are not limited to our analysis above. We just post the points that we are interested in. Interestingly, the first two points are related to color, which motivates us to leverage the color information to improve detection. We will demonstrate this later. After analyzing the datasets, we perform data preprocessing to obtain a more accurate dataset. For totally wrong labels, we just delete it. As for inaccurate labels, we will replace it with model predictions. Now let's introduce how we model wheat head detection problem. First, model selection and training are related to our baseline object detector. Second, dynamic color transform network is our core insight to tackle wheat head detection. Finally, we use model example and pursue labeling to improve the test performance. So the first question is that, what is a good object detector for wheat head detection? To answer this question, we investigate some state-of-the-art object detectors. For one-stage detectors, we have tried ATSS, FCOS, YOLO-V5, and scaled YOLO-V4. Regarding two-stage detectors, we tried FASTRCN and Cascade RCN. We find that scaled YOLO-V4 performs well on public leaderboard. Therefore, we choose it as our baseline object detector. Next question is how to train the baseline. Here, we summarize some tricks for training object detector. First, using cocoa pre-trained weights can speed up convergence. Second, we perform heavy data augmentation to increase the diversity of training samples, including mosaic, random fleet, random scaling, and Gaussian blur. Finally, we also tune the training parameters such as batch size, epoch, and learning rates. But we find that keeping the original training setting is sufficient to achieve good performance. Here we introduce our dynamic color transform network. We first start from an interesting observation. We find that tuning alpha and beta can improve detection, where alpha and beta are parameters of linear color transform, as shown in the right top equations. This figure shows the detection results of different alpha. We observe that tuning the value of alpha can elevate false negatives, as indicated by the blue circles. In addition, it can also suppress 
false positives, which is indicated by the red circles. We observe similar results when tuning the value of beta. Inspired by this observation, we come up with the idea of learning a dynamic color transform network. This figure illustrates the pipeline of our method. Specifically, we first pass the input image X through the DCT network to predict color transform parameter alpha and beta. They are used to obtain transform image X print. Then, we perform standard object detection on X print to compute the losses, which are used to update the DCT and the detection network. It is worth mentioning that our DCT is general. We can cooperate DCT with any existing object detectors. Here, we only initiate our DCT on scale UV4. But how to choose DCT network? In practice, we can use any existing networks like VGG, ResNet, and MobileNet. One may also design their own DCT networks. In this competition, we use ResNet as DCT network, which brings about 2% improvements on ADA metric. In addition, if the audience are interested in the details of DCT, you can refer to our paper, Dynamic Color Transform for Weight Head Detection, which has been accepted to the ICCV workshop CVPBA 2021. To improve the test performance, we further use model example and pursue labeling. We first use test time augmentation to obtain a set of predictions, including horizontal flip, vertical flip, and rotation. We then use model example to get final results, which brings around 2% improvements on ADA. As for pursuit labeling, we first predict some test data. The predictions are then treated as pursuit label to train a new model. The new model will make final predictions on test data. This slide shows the leaderboard. It is worth mentioning that our solution ranks first on the public leaderboard and ranks second on the private leaderboard. Finally, we make summary of our solution including key points of our solution, limitation, and future work. The key points are as follows. First, choosing a strong baseline can indeed save your time. Second, dynamic color transform network plays an important role in our solution, which brings notable improvements on ADA metric. Third, model example is helpful, which unveils the potential of our approach. Although our solution achieves promising results, there still exist limitations. For example, our model attempts to predict duplicate boxes on the same objects, which leads to false positives. Also, the blurred images may render detection failure. For future work, we may introduce stronger supervision to address the limitation of our method. For example, incorporating the relationship between weak head objects may be an interesting option. Also, we may further improve DCT network. That's all. Thank you. Great. Thanks, uh, Chang Chin, for a very nice and clear uh, video. Uh, so please, uh, audience members, if you have questions, you can type them into the Q&A panel, and then I'll see them as they show up. Um, uh, but maybe I'll start with, you know, I think you did a, a good job of of talking about the important aspects. Um, maybe to start, one question, Chen Chen. Chen. Um, when you tried different models, you said that scaled YOLO v4 worked well. Um, did you find some models that performed very poorly? Uh, we find that the two stage detectors, like faster RCN, does not perform well. Okay. Uh, okay. Great. And then, uh, Given that there was a, this was sort of a domain shift challenge, was there any, any aspects of your solution that were sort of inspired by this idea of domain shift? Uh, yes. Uh, we propose a dynamic color transform network to tackle a domain shift problem. That's our motivation, yes. Okay, great. And then um, there were some parameters in the dynamic color transform. Um, were those parameters hyper, uh, considered hyperparameters that were changed or were they learned 
uh, sort of directly in the training. Uh, the parameters of DCT network is learned, uh, is end-to-end -end learned. We jointly train with the detection network. Great. And a question from uh, Etienne, did you apply the DCT on small portions of the image, like patches of the image, or was it on the, the whole uh, image of, at a time? We perform it on the whole image. Did you find that, um, or do you think that there were local corrections uh, in, in illumination that might be benefited by this uh, local approach? Uh, yes, it's a interesting. Uh, it's an interesting option. Uh, we may try it later, but we have not tried it now. Okay, great. Uh, and uh, another question from the audience: um, uh, How to you? Uh, how how justified to use the and losses to guide the DCT network. So I guess, um, I, I guess using uh, maybe uh, using the loss function as a signal to, to change the DCT parameters, was that, um, uh, did that work well or are there alternatives that you tried? Oh, you mean the loss function? We just use mm -hmm. the detection loss to supervise the DCT network and we find it's, a, uh, we find it's sufficient to train the DCT network. Okay, great. Um, uh, one uh, additional question. So uh, this is from Dr. Barre. You presented different steps in a certain order. Would the order of selecting the best option influence the performance? Uh, order? Uh, I don't get you. Can you repeat that? Um, I I'm, I'm not sure, uh, Fred, if you want to clarify, but perhaps, um, maybe the, the order in sort of looking at which network to, to choose first and then looking at what augmentations were most important and then choosing the DCT. Maybe if you had started with the DCT model first um, and maybe tried different uh, sub-networks, would have that changed the results, do you think? Uh, in this competition, we first train, train a detection network, then we augment it with our DCT network then we join the chains, we find it sufficient uh, to achieve good performance. I don't know if I question as, uh, I don't know if I answer the question. Uh, I think, you know, I, I think that, uh, I think that's okay. Um, okay. And then in this competition, we, we had a public uh, leaderboard, so the public test set, and we also have a, had a hidden private test set. So um, <coughs> did you like that format for the competition or did that, change the way which you approached the problem? Uh, I think it's a proper way to evaluate the robustness of more detection models. And it does not change our approach to the competition. And it's also, the hidden sets is also widely used in other competitions. Great, well, thanks very much. And I also wanted to, to thank you for also submitting your work to the CVPPBA workshop. I think it's great to have that academic contribution recognized. And I think that uh, that will allow the wider phenotyping community to see the, the nice work. So thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the questions, everyone. So we'll move on to the, um, the, uh, the, sec the tied second place, uh, uh, other team, uh, David Gian. So just let me queue up this video. My name is David Gian. Today I'm going to present about the second place solution. This is online. First, I will introduce to the team. Our team member is one. I'm working as a computer vision engineer in Korea. I often participate in competition as a hobby. My solution is very simple. Let's keep the explanation of the data. I will explain the training pipeline. First of all, I decide to select the state-of-the-art detection baseline. I saw v 5 and Swin transformer for detection other sorter. 
I choose the yellow wave 5 because it is a familiar method to me. I've been using YOLO for 5 years and YOLO V5 has the recent augmentation. I use the progressive resizing for detection. This method shows good performance in image recognition. I thought it can also work for detection task. First, I trained the model with 512 size. Each size is 32, and I fridged the two photon layer to avoid overfitting. Second, I fine tuned the 1280 size model from 512 size model. Shadow labeling is used a lot in recent competition. I used the competence 0.3 to prevent the noise data. And I used these shadow labels to train the new model. The sim this simple trick can also be used for semi-supervised learning. In the previous models, I used the base augmentation in YOLO V5. Until then, the performance was not good. So, I was looking for another method. I read the last winner solution, and I found the commix is help for this heat detection. I add the commix augmentation in the training. It is my last model that gave me second place. I submit the result with 1600 size, competence 0.6, and augment option. tried classification to avoid false positive, but it didn't achieve better result. I think if I can get good negative samples from training dataset, then I could better result. I thought you can get a good accuracy with more negative samples. I didn't use the ensemble in the competition. I wanted to train swing transformer for detection to make ensemble model, but I didn't have a time. Thank you for listening. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, thanks, David, for the uh, nice presentation. So we'll move to uh, question and answers. Um, maybe I'll start with a general question. So. What do you think was um, the most important aspect of your solution? I think bridging the bottom layer and data augmentation make my model as a more generalization. I was able to get better performance from hidden taste set. And do you know how much improvement uh, the pseudo labeling had, like um, the increase in, in performance on the public data? I, I didn't check it. Um... Great. And then a uh, question uh, Etienne asked that you applied your model on larger images uh, than the ones used in the competition. Uh, Oh, uh, maybe that was for the previous, uh, sorry. Um, great, uh, a new question from Wei. Do you think that color-based augmentations like grayscale or color change would help the model? Yes, I think. Okay, did you try any of the color-based augmentations? Um. HSV augmentation, HSV transform. Great. Uh, so HSV, okay. So that was one color transformation, great. And uh, question, why did you choose uh, 1600 pixels as the input size? Mm. Uh, I, 
listen, uh, listen paper, uh, report the larger image, get a good results. So I use the large, large image. Okay, and uh, so you used YOLO V5. Did you try other models that didn't uh, work well initially? I didn't try. Just tried YOLO V5. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. Uh, great. And a question from the audience. Uh, do you think that the new version of YOLO, YOLO X uh, would perform better? Do you have any uh, experience? Yes, I use a recent Yolo five version. Yeah, I see. So maybe not, uh, haven't tried that. And um, so you say you've done many competitions. So uh, uh, was there something uh, different about your approach to this competition with wheat heads than you have used on other uh, object detection competitions? Or was it sort of the same approach as other competitions you've tried? Um, I don't have a different approach in this competition compared to other competitions. Sorry, could you repeat that answer? I didn't, I couldn't hear. I, I didn't try two different methods. Oh, I see. So same, same procedure. Yeah. Yes. I see. Okay, great. And how did, how, in this competition, we had the hidden private test set. Uh, how did you feel about having a private uh, test set for the competition? Did that, uh, was that a good approach? Um, I think hiding the test set is a fair way, uh, but it didn't affect my model. Yes, but I, Try to freezing the bottom layer to to prevent shake up. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, uh, thanks very much, David. I, I don't see any other questions, so uh, thanks for your time uh, today. We appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so now we'll move on to the video uh, from. A uh, random team name um, with Hanlin Yu, who's here to present. Uh, so let me just uh, start the video for this. It is my pleasure to present our solution for the Global Wheat Challenge competition. Firstly, a brief introduction of our, of our team. I am Hanlin Yu, currently a master student at the University of Helsinki, Finland. I am interested in object detection and statistical machine learning. My teammate is Zhong Zhechen. He's currently a master's student at the University of British Columbia, Canada. He is interested in image-to-image -image translation, object tracking, object detection, and generative adversarial network. Now, I will talk about our solution. Our solution can be found on this GitHub repo. Basically, we use user v5 along with other domain well set, pseudo labeling, testing augmentation, and model ensemble. We started with data cleaning. As opposed on the forum mentioned, there are two duplicates in the training CSV. So we identify them and clean them. Afterwards, we split the training data set into folds. The good thing about it are that first it's quite cross validation. We can perform hyperparameter tun tuning. Secondly, it allows us to train multiple models using the same data, enabling model ensemble. Now the problem becomes how to divide the data set into train set and well set. According to Wiles, there are two ways to achieve this in domain well set and out of domain well set. The former performs better when there are just a few similar domains. The area selected is more effective when there are more distinct domains. We observed that the global weight data set contained 17 domains. We feel that out of domain could be better than in domain. 
asymptomain only allows identical domains in train set and while set, while out of domain allows different domains for train and while, which coincides with the competition's aim. As you can see on this slide, we randomly split the training data into four folds, each with roughly the same number of samples. For the architecture, we chose user wavefile instead of MM detection on Detectron 2, as it is known to provide high performance while being easy to use. And actually, we originally planned to try another architecture other than user wavefile so that we could ensemble models from different architectures. But we dropped the plan because we didn't have enough time. As for the Z version of Yolo V5, which holds Yolo V5X, experiments show that it performed better than Yolo V5L. As for Yolo V5X6, we feel that the performance boost in detecting large objects is not that useful in this competition. For test time augmentation, we used Euler Wave 5 default strategy, i.e., with flip and scale. We had two branches on our fork of Euler Wave 5, original and master. The original branch consisted of some basic adjustments, the most, the most significant one being adjustment of hyperparameters which I will talk more about in the next slide. The master branch was built upon the original branch using weighted boxes fusion to assemble labels from test time augmentation mentioned in the previous slide. We had two sets of, of hyperparameters, scratch and fine tune. Scratch and fine tune are each based on user real files, scratch and fine tune, but all with several adjustments. The most significant ones are first, flip UD to 0 0.5, mix up to 0 0.3, and L uh, LR0 adjusted on case by case basis. And the models were trained in 800 by 800 resolution with a best sign of 8. We did not go for a larger training resolution just because of the VRAM limits on Google CoLab Pro. I am now going to talk about training. In stage one, we trained four models on the four folds with original branch and scratch hyperparameters. And in stage two, we trained five models. The first four models are trained based on the four models in stage one using original branch and fine tune parameters. The fifth model is trained on the fourth fold as fine tune with the fourth model in stage one using master branch and fine tune parameters. We grabbed the fourth just because it had the best ATA in this stage. Before talking about stage three, I would like to talk, talk about our ensemble strategy. We trained four, five models in stage two and predicted five sets of labels using those five models. Then we used weighted boxes fusion to assemble the five sets of labels. One hack in this step is that we observed that the confidence of prediction generated by the model with master branch is significantly smaller than that using the ori original branch while it had the best performance on public leaderboard. So we applied a step of, of SQRT ED before fitting it into weighted boxes fusion. So in stage three, we started by using ensemble as described above to, gen to generate a set of labels. Then we found towards the fifth model in stage two with multi branch and phantom parameters. The model trained during this stage was used to generate our predictions, which ranked the first on the final leaderboard. We felt that the limitations of our solution 
can mainly be concluded with these three points. Firstly, in balance between forms, each force performance while trying with identical model and parameters can be quite different. For instance, model trying with the last fold was significantly stronger than the others. We believed this would damage the effectiveness of model assembling and pseudo labeling. This further led to the second limitation, as we did some fault specific hyperparameters tuning, which was time quite time consuming. The third point is that it lacks explainability, as we cannot fully explain why it worked that way. In my opinion, the key points of our solution are that first, we used out of domain well set. It's four folds, it enables better validation. Second, we use pseudo labeling. In fact, we applied two rounds of it. Pseudo labeling brought considerable boost to the model's performance. Third, model ensemble. We used weighted box diffusion, which after experiment after experiments was in most cases superior than Euler V5 default strategy. As for future potential work, firstly, we feel like using more stages of pseudo labeling can be helpful. As two rounds are better than one round, it might be better to have more rounds. We try training the model for three rounds, but data for three only, it achieved an ADA score of 0 0.698 in final leaderboard, only a 0 0.002 gap from our top result. Considering that it only used three quarters of the training samples, the result was quite surprising. Unfortunately, we did not dig further into it as it had a very low ADA in public leaderboard. Secondly, domain generalization algorithm can be tried. We experimented with IRM, or invariant risk minimization, but it did not live up to our expectation. Thirdly, better test time augmentation strategy can be helpful. While according to our experiments, other test time augmentation methods was not better than the default, default one, we feel like there could be a better strategy out there. Fourth, assembling of different architectures is quite promising. We only used Euler V5. So using predictions from other models, for example, visual transformers can be beneficial. Thank you. That is the end of my presentation. Great, uh, thanks very much, uh, Hanlon, for the nice uh, video. Um, so I'll start again with the, maybe a general question about, so I see, I see focused on YOLO v5 architecture, were there others that you tried that maybe didn't work as well from the beginning? Uh, yeah, I mean, for, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so at the start, we, we were also considering about using unknown detection and detection from two, as they were quite popular and the benchmark results were promising. And my teammate tested these frameworks and he tried to debug them on his Windows machine, but he was unable to make them work. Okay, so it might be compatibility issues mixed with some known issues of the REPL. So we just switched to Euler V5 because it worked flawlessly. And we also try different Euler V5 models like Euler V5 L, uh, which is more lightweight than Euler V5 X, enabling a larger batch size or resolution, but the results were not competitive. And we did not observe performance boost on Euler V5 X6 in our limited experiments as well. Great, thank you. Um, one thing I liked about your solution is that you approached the problem at you know, as a domain shift problem directly by using the out of domain uh, validation set. Um, so uh, I guess a, a question, did you try any other specific uh, things to try to, uh, to, to try to address the, the potential distribution shift between the uh, public and private 
test sense? Uh, yeah. So uh, we have in integrated IIM through our networks for, I mean, the invariant risk, risk minimization. And we found a hard balance its impacts on the loss function. And it, overall, it hurts the performance a lot. And we also wanted to try some methods that could utilize the domain information in the data set, like RAX, a domain generalization method via risk extra extrapolation. But we had difficulty integrating them to our networks, so eventually we gave up. But I think it could be beneficial. I see. Yeah. And I think that um, now that the data set is part of the WILDS uh, metadata set, I think there'll be probably be more chance to try these domain generalization approaches uh, through WILDS. Um, uh, another question. So you, you uh, were the top uh, solution for the competition and your graduate students. Um, I was wondering if um, you had considered writing up your solution as a, a paper, academic paper for the workshop, or if there's anything we can do to encourage uh, solutions to write papers in the future. Uh, well, I don't quite know about this because, uh, I mean, uh, my team, actually my teammate has more experience in writing papers than I do, and yeah. I think it's definitely very encouraging uh, to encourage the competitors to write their papers, and we will really be, I mean, really uh, exciting to do this. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, great. And um, I wonder, have do you uh, participate in other competitions quite frequently? And were there things you did specifically for the wheat competition compared to other competitions you've participated in? Uh, I mean, we we wouldn't consider us as, as to I mean experiments competitors, but what I found interesting about this competition is that we are given the domain information, and each domain can be quite different. This obviously required some specific processing. For instance, we used other domain file sets, and it also implies that the public, the final public, the final leaderboard could be quite different from the public one. And as the model's performance can be quite different on different domains. And this means that um, we should make some efforts to prevent overfitting. Great. Well, thanks. Thanks very much for your time. And congratulations again on the, the top submission. Uh, I don't see any other questions, so maybe we'll uh, uh, leave it there. I just have a couple final uh, slides um, that I'll come back to. Uh, so I wanted to, to thank uh, Hanlin, David, and Chen Chin for presenting their work today. I think it's really nice to see that, and thank you for uh, your nice response to the questions. And then I again want to want really to, to emphasize and thank all of the collaborating institutions and researchers who collected the data, organized it, annotated it, and decided to share it publicly with the community. I think this is uh, you know, a, a really positive uh, project. Um, in particular, I wanna thank the, the team in France for providing uh, a large number of data sets, and in particular, uh, Etienne, David, who really took the lead on organizing the competitions. And the only reason that Etienne is not uh, hosting today is because he's very close to finishing his dissertation. So I agree to, to fill in for him. So thanks very much to, to Etienne in particular. So the future of this project, you know, we, we call it the Global Wheat uh, dataset and we have a good coverage from many parts of the world, but there are still many regions of the world that grow wheat that are not represented here. So we really do hope to encourage and collect these additional data sets from new regions. So I would encourage you, if you have collaborators in South America, Africa, the Middle East, Asia, um, uh, North Asia uh, Northern Asia, certainly we'd be uh, very interested in, in having them participate in the future versions of this, uh, of this data set. And we've focused really on phenotyping of wheat heads, which we think is important, but there's of course many other types of phenotypes and other information, uh, auxiliary data, and, and including the, the genotypic information of these wheat varieties that we would like to include in future competitions. And then I will also just uh, promote the 
computer vision and plant phenotyping and agriculture workshop, which is happening at ICCV this uh, October. So the workshop will be on October 11th. Uh, and as, as I mentioned, the, the wheat competition, there are a number of, of papers that um, have used the wheat data set that will be presented at the workshop, as well as other general phenotyping papers. So uh, we would encourage you to register for ICCV and, and then attend the workshop on October 11th. And thanks um, very much for everyone who, um, who came today uh, and, and asked questions. And again, congratulations to all the competitors. Thanks very much.